Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, our region's longest running public affairs program. Lawmakers from Northeastern Minnesota are joining us today for a recap of the week's activities at the state capitol. This is your opportunity to call or email your legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, Tony Sertich. The 2024 legislative session is just a few weeks from its conclusion already. Legislators are working hard as deadlines are fast approaching. Viewers, tonight you will have a chance to hear about the latest updates. Now is your opportunity to email or call in with your questions for lawmakers that represent you. Uh, to ask a question, dial the phone number on your screen, or you can also email your questions to ask at pbsnorth.org. Joining us in studio today is Senator Jason Rarick, a Republican from Pine City, representing the 11th District. Welcome, Senator Rarick. And also joining us is Representative Natalie Zlesnikar, a Republican from Friedenburg Township, representing District 3B. Welcome, Representative Zlesnikar. Great to have you both here today. Yeah, so this is the very first uh, Minnesota Legislative Report of the session, but we're way into the session already, which starts late. Um, the biggest uh, bill that generally happens in the second year uh, that you're serving here is the capital investment bill, sometimes called a bonding bill, mm -hmm. funds projects, uh, building projects all across the state. Um, seen as probably the highest priority of the session by most. Uh, we'll start with you, Senator Rarick. Is that the highest priority of the session or are there other priorities that you deem higher? No, that would probably be, uh, I think everyone would uh, consider that the highest priority mm -hmm. this year. Uh, there are some policy things working their way through, but um, typically policy doesn't need to get done. Um, it's the funding that's always the big item and the infrastructure needs are big right now. Representative Zlesnikar, would you agree or are there other priorities that you would put ahead of the capital investment bill? I think the capital investment bill is something that is, you know, the top, a top priority for sure. Child care is a priority. I sit on the Workforce Committee and, and Children and Family. So I think the child care initiatives are uh, very important too. Yeah, we'll definitely dig into that as the hour goes on and encourage folks uh, to call in or write in with your questions. Let's stick to the capital investment bill. Uh, generally, uh, the governor goes first in pr his proposal. So he proposed a fairly significant bill, mostly about maintaining current assets, statewide assets or state-owned assets. I know then a lot of legislators locally from their communities will have local initiatives that they deem important as well. And of course, the colleges and transportation funding is also mm -hmm. important. Uh, Senator Rarick, do you wanna talk about what some of your priorities are uh, in passing this capital investment bill? Yeah, I think I've been a pretty vocal uh, this year that I want to see the bonding bill focused on infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, roads and bridges, water infrastructure, and asset preservation. Um, the local projects, if they fit into those categories, um, I'm, I'm good with that. But, uh, you know, I, a lot of these extra, uh, what I would call a lot of wants, I'm hoping uh, we keep those out this year and stick uh, pretty focused on those core needs and, and then I think I'm willing to go anywhere from that 850 million they're talking potentially up to as much as a billion as as long as we stick to that core need. And because uh, capital investment is borrowing it actually takes a super majority of the legislature to pass this bill and even though the House and the Senate and the governor are all DFLers right now this would take bipartisan support to get this bill passed from both chambers. Representative Lesnikar, uh, any priorities that you want to see either specific to your district or generally in this capital investment bill to gain your support? I think uh, for me one of the items that falls into what Senator Rarick is talking about is uh, water and sewer extensions in Proctor. Proctor didn't have any bonding money for that community you know, last year and we know workforce housing is really important and we need to have single family homes for our employees and have varieties of options for housing for people. So the extensions for uh, Proctor area would be huge that's a priority. The public safety uh, building expansion and a training center is another priority. And then one of the other things that just happened last year, the Hermantown uh, Arena got an allocation of money and the delayed projects, there's many of them that were having significant gaps in what those project costs came in at. And so cities and counties are dealing with that across the state. And so that's another smaller amount to try to, try to get that actually completed and done. 
So, uh, Senator Rourke, you sit on the Higher Education Committee. Can you talk a bit about uh, what you're seeing as requests from higher education, uh, because they're generally ones that come to the table with significant needs for a capital investment bill? Yeah, um, you know, both the, the Min State system and the U of N both came in with uh, requests of right around that 500 million mark, which- A piece. Yeah, a piece. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, we had to be blunt with them and say, boy, if we did everything you're both asking for, the bonding bill's done and <laughs> nothing else gets done. Um, they've both been very good at uh, kind of coming back with um, show, helping us, on, you know, see maybe around a 200 million, uh, what would be really important for them. So, you know, like I said, that is in that asset preservation. Those are things that I, um, I think they got a lot of good projects, things that we need to consider in, in this bonding bill. So, and that's, that is good. The Min State system, that's all around the state. You know, the education needs a, that we're meeting all around the state. So I sure hope we can uh, look at that and get that done. Sounds great. Well, please uh, call in or, or email in your questions. Uh, I'll keep firing away at this topic because this is the main one uh, for the session. Uh, there was a capital investment bill that was passed last year, um, and generally the second year of the two years the legislature meets is the main year. Uh, what's interesting about this session is you guys could do nothing. There's nothing you have to do. The budget gets passed last year for two years, mm -hmm. and there have been times where there hasn't been a capital investment bill passed in this second year. and. You know, nothing happens legislatively, but you know, certainly these projects then stay on the back burner. Representative Lesnikar, uh, if you could put on your prognostication hat, what, what do you think the likelihood of uh, getting a bill passed this year, a capital investment bill is? You know, I would hope that, that we'll get the bill done. I think the concern is we're going into 2025 with what's being labeled as a structural imbalance, but it's a deficit. And so the reality is, is that the $17.5 billion that we had historic money for in 2023 was spent in five months. And so that money's gone. And so now the needs are compounding in various levels. So all of us are seeing tremendous needs coming in the million dollar marks. We have behavior health needs. We have situations of the prisons. We have 50% higher civil, civil commitments and people waiting in our prisons to get proper placement. And we have people waiting in hospitals and the list goes on. So there's a tremendous amount of need. It's not a matter if there's a need. The issue is where are we gonna get the money? We're in a deficit in 2025 and we already raised taxes by $10 billion in fees. So we have to make some really tough choices. And so the same thing with the bonding, we have to be looking at where are we going for the next five years for Minnesota. Great. Senator Rarick, uh likelihood of the capital investment bill passing from your perspective this year? Uh, as long as we stay focused on the infrastructure, I think they're very good. Uh, when you look at what uh, last year's bonding bill included, uh, a lot of money for nonprofits um, and a lot of, again, projects I would call wants rather than needs. Uh, I think you're gonna struggle to get uh, Republican senators to vote for a bill that would be anything like last year's bill. Uh, please uh, send in your questions, uh, either by phone or by email. Uh, Representative Lesnikar, you touched a bit on surplus deficit. You know, there's a state budget forecast where they look ahead every year. And in this current budget, uh, they're projecting a $3.7 billion surplus currently. And you talked about what's gonna potentially happen next year when inflation is factored in in the next two year budget. Uh, Go Governor Walsh came out with uh, what some would call a modest budget proposal mm -hmm. for the surplus. Mm -hmm. Once again, this doesn't need to be done, but generally in the second year, there are alterations in the budget. Um, are there any spending needs that you see in this current budget that you'd like to see included in what is a supplemental budget? I think it's clear to me after sitting at committees that in health and human service and finance committee that you know, we have people waiting in the hospitals that have no place to go. We have behavior health needs, mental health needs, and uh, like I already said, the civil commitment issues where the jails don't have, uh, you know, places for the people to be in the appropriate placement. So that's a definite issue that we have. Uh, the, there's been task force meeting on this, and so we're gonna have to find some solutions. And that's gonna take a lot of money. And so the things we're dealing with right now cost a lot of money to fix the issue. We have nursing homes that had supplemental money last year, but we haven't fixed a structural problem for years to come. And so we have nursing homes, assisted livings, childcare, mental health and behavior health. So we have a lot of uh, programs, social programs that really need to be dealt with uh, for a long-term strategy. 
Do you see that happening, though, this legislative session with the supplemental I, budget? I think there, there's going to be some pieces, is my guess. We're going to see some things with ambulance services. I've sat on the EMS task force, aging service task force. And so, you know, we have some situations where greater Minnesota is you know, imploding with not being able to provide services for the for that whole region. So I think there will be some in, incremental, incremental uh, decisions made on some of those topics like Greater Minnesota for Ambulance Services and then behavioral health units and mental health because we have to do something. But, yep. the, but the planning for a longer range plan to, to your point is going to take more than this year. Okay, let's stick on this emergency ser medical services uh, mm -hmm. topic and Senator Eric will get back to you in a second but want you to be included in this discussion. You served on this uh, mm -hmm. EMS emergency medical service and talked about this need of ambulances, mm -hmm. uh, EMTs and others in greater Minnesota. Traditionally this has been something that has been funded in two ways by local property taxes uh, mm -hmm. from local communities but then also local government aid or county aid that the state has put in. So uh, whose responsibility do you see this being? Uh, I know Governor Walls put in I want to say his, in his proposal, he's proposing about $16 million. We know that uh, the report that came out was much larger need. Mm -hmm. But where does this responsibility lie in your mind about who should be funding these core government services like uh, EMS services? In my mind, I'm surprised it's not considered essential services. I, I think that uh, it is an essential service if you're calling for an ambulance. It's, it's essential to me, and I think it's essential to everybody that I've talked to. So I think that we're in a situation where the funding, we have a pattern of how we've done the funding, but the reimbursement rates are not uh, sustainable for what people get for medical assistance rates. And then there's lots that go into ambulance services. And it's not just the transporting time, but we've had hospitals close services in different parts of the greater Minnesota. So now people are traveling two to four hours in and transporting people to get the cath lab or the certain type of special service they need, which requires ambulance transport. So there's a variety of reasons that have that have created this. And then in the reports that I've looked at, 70% of the ambulance calls are being used and it's non-emergency transport. And so Greater Minnesota really is lacking non-emergency transportation, which I think we have to look at. And that is an essential component for federal funding too, is to have that infrastructure in place for the state of Minnesota. So I think there is a responsibility we have at the state of Minnesota for emergency services without a doubt. Emergency service needs, is that a state responsibility, Senator Rarick? And what do you think about this issue, issue more broadly? Yeah, you know, and this is one I've been working on uh, very closely. Uh, you know, the Cloquet um, and the surrounding area have created a fire and ambulance uh, district, uh, it's first of its kind in the state. Uh, I've been working with Chief Buse on this model. Um, they do have levy authority, but it, especially in an area that is so rural, um, they just don't have the ability to levy enough to keep the services going. So they absolutely need uh, the state to step up because we have those travelers that are coming through, especially um, that area with the freeway and then continuing up to the range. Um, you know, people expect those uh, emergency services to be there. So uh, Chief Buse is actually gonna be at the Capitol tomorrow and I'm gonna be working with him and some of our uh, tax uh, staff. Um, Local government aid doesn't work. It's a little bit of a d calculation that won't fit their model, but uh, we're gonna be looking at options to say, what can we do? Uh, because for them, unlike so many other fire uh, departments and ambulance services that are run through a city where local government aid would then be able to go to help them, uh, their entity doesn't get any of that because they're not under the city of Cloquet or any of the townships. Uh, but it's actually a model that uh, Chief Buse has had a number of people from around the state saying, how does this work? This might work very well in our area. Um, if we can figure out that piece where they would get that uh, reliable state aid, I think that model is going to, could be very helpful for our rural areas around Minnesota to keep these emergency services available. So yeah, uh, the state component of that uh, will be critical. So it sounds like a stopgap this year, but more conversation uh, in years to come. We'll put that in that bucket, just like the last <laughs> issue. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, continuing to talk about this budget uh, surplus and some supplemental spending, Senator Rarick, I know you've been involved in uh, college funding for foster children. And this has been an issue that came up that was unaddressed last year, unintentionally left out last year. Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, where the gap was and it seems like there's a path to success and some bipartisan support in getting this done? 
Yeah, so um, background, three years ago um, when I was uh, vice chair of the higher ed committee, uh, a group of foster advocates came and pitched this concept, you know, foster kids struggle in areas that so many others don't because when they turn 18, graduate high school, they lose their support groups, you know, they age out of the system. Mm -hmm. And it be can become very difficult for them to get into a post-secondary education. So I carried a bill that would give them free uh, tuition plus living uh, expenses covered as well. And I uh, went to Chair Tomasoni uh, at the time and he believed in it as well. And so we did pass that uh, through three years ago. Um, last year, it wasn't that it wasn't funded, it was just underestimated how many uh, students would take advantage of that. And they fell short by, we estimate about $5 million. And when they came forward with what their solution would be, it was to put the kids on a waiting list and then first come, first serve, they would dole out the money. Well, um, unfortunately, you know, the fosters came forward. Um, it, we were kind of blindsided. There were a number of uh, legislators and the foster advocate groups were blindsided by this idea. Uh, once we found out, uh, I started letting everybody know we have to talk to Senator Marty, who was the chair of the finance committee, uh, Senator Murphy, who's the majority leader, express our concern and say we have to fi figure this out. And I think my first push was with the one-time money that's there, the surplus money, let's use the five to six million dollars, pay for it. Um, and then we'd have future to come and look at the rest of it. Um, what they did discover actually, and uh, which I believe will be the solution that we move forward with, is the North Star promise that was passed last year actually has quite a bit of extra money that was put into it. So we're gonna use five million uh, from that fund to cover the fosters for the rest of this fiscal um, cycle. And then next year we will come back and, and look at, well, what are the real numbers? And hopefully we continue our promise and uh, help them see their post-secondary education come through. Great, can you uh, talk a bit about this money you said is coming from the North Star Promise Act? Can you explain what that is as well? Yeah, this is, this is another one that I'm working on. Uh, the North Star Promise was uh, the bill that was passed last year that uh, anyone whose family is making less than $80,000 a year, you get free tuition at the Minn State system or the U of M system. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, my concerns that I voiced last year and continuing to work, it's actually um, what, what I was worried about is, is we're hearing now from the colleges, um, my big fear was these private scholarships and the foundation scholarships through each uh, system, the, pe the donors would be looking at it saying, why would I give money if students are gonna get free tuition anyway? Mm -hmm. And so, and the department is saying the, the North Star Promise is the last dollar in. It comes after these private foundations and private scholarships like your Lions Clubs and VFWs and such. So I'm trying to work uh, with uh, Chair Fateh and figure out how we make sure that the North Star Promise money would be looked at first. And we've got one little piece of that figured out um, through the Minn State system, any of the uh, foundation monies uh, through those schools would actually come later so that they can adjust and put those towards um, stipends or book expenses or living expenses. So we're actually helping the students see school more affordable than the funding, getting the same level of funding it just coming from a different source. So I uh, have to continue working for the U of M system uh, so that they get the same uh, kind of coverage or protection, but I, I think it's doable. Um, and uh, a lot of money was put into that to, to get it up and going and that's why they did overshoot that one a bit. Um, so that's why the five million is there and available. Um, and I'm hoping when, as we've been looking at the numbers that have been running, one of the big discussions that's been happening with that North Star Promise is our private colleges have been left out of that mix. But, you know, we have some very good programs. I mean, St. Scholastica has great programs in this area. Um, you know, a lot of schools, private schools have the teacher programs that are churning out most of our a lot of our teachers. Um, and so I, if that's the school that a student feels is the most fitting for them, I think the North Star Promise money should be able to go to one of these private colleges as well. And right now it sure appears that there's enough money in there to expand it uh, to those schools as well. Representative Lesnikar, anything to add on this higher education funding or the foster uh, 
children effort? I sit on children and families committee, so we, we heard about the, the foster program and the concern with that. So I, I think what Senator Rarick and has stated is all accurate, and I look forward to seeing the bill come to the floor so we can vote on it and get that taken care of. And it sounds like bipartisan mm -hmm. support in both bodies, so seems like, you know, knock on wood, this is moving forward. Yeah, I think everyone wanted mm -hmm. to do it. It was just a matter of is there a spot we can find the money and yeah. being we've found a spot that I think will have zero impact on other things, I, I believe this one will get done. Okay, we got questions rolling in and we're gonna be getting to a bunch of them right now. Um, you know, this is the time of the legislative session. You're getting towards the end already. There's uh, only about a month and change to go here. Uh, the, the, the issues winnow now, right? There are deadlines where anybody can, any legislator can introduce as many bills as they want, but then there's deadlines to say, if we haven't heard or acted upon your bills, they kind of get put off to the side. And we've met some of those deadlines and there's other deadlines mm -hmm. coming up. However, uh, one bill that already got passed this legislative session and signed into law dealt with school resource officers. Now this was an issue that came up last legislative session and then the, there were some that wanted to make changes to that. And so it changes happened to the school resource officer uh, legislation. Representative Lesnar, I'll start with you to talk about what the issue was and uh, do, were you supportive of the solution that was signed? I was supportive of the solution last year, you know, to try to get this fixed. And I, I was thrilled to see that Representative Witte, one of my colleagues uh, who is a, was a school resource officer, was able to help participate in a bipartisan way to partner on to find solutions that would work, that would work for the cities, that would deal with the liability issues that that law enforcement had with the language that was changed. Sometimes one, two words matters. And so that was really important to get clarity so that the comfort level was there where the rules wouldn't be different for engagement for a police officer in the school or outside of the school and to get some of those things taken care of. And, and they worked through that language and I think uh, school resource officers have been reinstated now uh, it's last week, I believe, so that's a success. And so just so I'm understanding and the viewers at home are understanding, a school resource officer is a police officer Correct. contracted with the school district to work within the school district. Yes. And the language we're talking about here dealt with uh, putting a student in the prone position. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, there, I think there was a, to your point, there was, I think, some misunderstandings of how and, and how things were going to be working in the schools, but the real issue became the officers are trained and they're trained for various situations in the school and out of the school. And so what happened with the language change is that the police officers that are called at school resource officers were being forced to not intervene timely within the school. They'd have to call for outside help, which just only created more issues uh, inside of our schools. And we saw that un unravel across the state. We saw it happen in the Man Mankato School District. We saw it happen in various school districts. So it took care of, uh, streamlining that so that there wasn't confusion on what the role is, how the police are trained, and they, they were able to find uh, a pathway forward that works for everybody. So that has been taken care of now. Senator Rarick, anything to add on this? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, so we've heard from law enforcement that they believe this works for them and our school resource officers have gotten back in. For me, what I feel is unfortunate and on the Senate side, uh, we brought up what caused the whole problem was that the school resource officers were then considered school employees, even though they're, you know, the school was reimbursing the county or the city, whoever the uh, officer worked for, um, but they were being considered a school employee. And what was also passed in the bill was that school employees can no longer restrain a child. And that's how this, the, SROs got pulled into this whole deal. So the issue has been fixed for the SRO because they're not considered a school employee anymore. But we're hearing from our teachers um, that they're not allowed to restrain a child under any circumstances. So when they have a child that is destroying the room, um, they cannot stop them. They can't, you know, put them in a little bear hug or anything like that to calm them down, to stop them from damaging the room. So I think that is a piece that we still have to talk about and work through because we fix the piece for SROs, but our school personnel need to be able to have some ability to uh, work with the kids and stop them. Um, right now, the only time they can do anything is if they believe another student is in imminent danger. 
and I think there are other situations that we have to say a, a, a teacher or another school uh, staff person need to have that ability to restrain a child to get them under control. Another uh, education topic from a viewer emailing in right now. Mm -hmm. Why has there been no movement or talk about teacher pension reform this year? Should a teacher who pays 8% of their salary per year really have to teach 43 plus years to earn a full pension? Senator Rourke, you sit on the Education Finance Committee. Can you talk a bit about this issue? Yeah, so uh, I did spend two years on the Pension Commission, um, was not on it last year, um, but I've been uh, talking with a number of teachers over this last year, and especially, you know, this really came to the forefront last year, about March. Unfortunately, it was because teachers saw the what we call the target, uh, the amount of money that was given to the Pension Commission to work with. And it was very obvious that uh, the pension reform that teachers were looking for, there was no way to do it with the amount of money that was assigned to that area. Um, unfortunately, back in December and January, when a lot of the, those discussions are, having, are being made to how much money is going where, um, I don't believe uh, people were really made aware of just how important this pension reform was to teachers. Um, Education Minnesota was not advocating for them the way teachers expected. And so they've continued to have those discussions. Unfortunately, I think there have been a lot of discussions this year. Unfortunately, when you look at um, now the reality of the budget like we've been talking about with um, so much less um, this year available, that's all basically all one-time money uh, and a structural deficit facing us in the future, it became much harder. Last year was the year to get this pension reform done. And unfortunately, that discussion uh, and People were made aware far too late. Um, I, I believe everybody uh, wants to get something done. I don't believe the rule of 90 is going to come back that uh, teachers had for many years. But um, it, it's been interesting talking to superintendents uh, and school boards. Um, the big issue that I'd have never considered uh, in thinking about this is when a teacher can retire in that 58 to 60 age range, they'll come back and substitute. And that's who our substitute teachers are in our schools. If they don't retire till they're 64 or 65, they're not coming back to substitute. And now what are our schools gonna do uh, for substitutes? So this isn't just about uh, figuring out uh, this issue for the teachers to be able to retire. This has ripple effects through the school on their budget and their substitute teachers as well, so. Thoughts on this issue? Thank you for the question. And I heard from educators across the state. I grew up with a middle school principal and I heard from a lot of educators saying, look, we want the opportunity to have unre, unre um, not have reduced benefits in order to retire after 30 years of service. They want to retire at 62. And I think the teachers really expected with a historic budget surplus that almost was $20 billion that that would happen, and it didn't. And so now we're in this year and we're going forward. So I did sign on a bill, House File 3808, that would allow teachers a pathway to retire at 62 without having reduced benefits. And so it's a pathway that doesn't require money from the state when we don't have the money right now because it's millions uh, that would be ongoing investment. but. It was so important to the teachers to have this in education that I signed on to a bill that would give an opportunity. It would increase their contribution every pay period uh, in a calculated manner, but it, it allows them at least to have a pathway. It's not perfect, but it allows an option. Well, let's keep those uh, questions coming in over email and the number on your screen. Um, you both t talked about just recently here, uh, and I want to pivot in a little different direction, about hearing from teachers, hearing from superintendents, hearing from folks back home. Uh, to the viewers here who want to contact our citizen legislators, what's the best way to get a hold of you, especially during this time of legislative session? How do you hear from people back home, and what's the most effective way that they can get your attention? Because I know you guys are traveling back and forth from the Twin Cities to back home, and uh, you've got email, uh, letters take a long time right now, phone calls. 
Can you, can you talk a bit about how you keep your finger, finger on the pulse back home and what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, Representative Lesnikar, you want to go take this one first? I, I'd let everybody know to reach out to look at the Minnesota House of Representatives. Just go on the website. It lists House members and it lists Senate members. You can see it. And just scroll down and then you can choose to... Uh, to subscribe to the weekly newsletters. You can shoot an email to me at my legislative email. Otherwise, I give people my uh, cell number to reach out to, and so they can do that. Senator Rarick. Yeah, you know, um, the emails, uh, the phone calls to our offices, um, we get all those messages. The one thing that I would tell people too, um, which the teachers really did uh, last year in uh, at April and into May, um, and a lot of groups do it. Um, if you ha if you're part of a group that is having a day at the Capitol, uh, come down. Um, we all make it a priority if a constituent actually comes down to St. Paul rather than just doing an email or a phone call. Um, we will make the time to meet with you if you're coming to St. Paul, especially for those of us whose districts are uh, a ways away where you know, you know someone has uh, made a commitment to get there. Uh, we'll take the time and listen to what you came to the Capitol concerned about. And, and the other thing too, I, I encourage people that say they came down, uh, like I said, with uh, whatever group, it's like, okay, you, you've got your things with this group, what else is concerning you? you? You've come all this way, let's talk about everything that you wanna talk about. So, but if you're not coming to the Capitol, the email and phone calls always get through to us. Thank you. And emails and phone calls get through to us here <laughs> at the show too, so please keep those coming in as well. Uh, every year, uh, the governor of the state gives their state of the state address. And very recently, Governor Walls uh, gave his state of the state address in Owatonna at the school district he taught in. Um, he said the state of the state of Minnesota is strong. Uh, agree, disagree, what, what, what word would you use uh, the state of the state of Minnesota? Senator Rarick. I'd probably use fair uh, at this point. Uh, I hear from a lot of folks, um, you know, they're concerned about where our taxes are. You know, we're one of the, we're in the top five, I guess, depending on what category you're looking at. Uh, some put us in top one or two. Um, I tend to think we're more in that four to five range overall. Um, so there's concerns about that. Um, I think uh, people are concerned about some of the things that happened uh, last year, some of the, the mandates and just how much happened last year. And unfortunately hearing people who are considering moving to other states. So I, I, would, I still think with our work ethic and uh, everything, um, just the resources that we have here, people love living here. Uh, I'm, I can't go below fair, but I can't, I can't say we're in a great place or even a good place right now. People are concerned and a little bit worried. Representative yeah. Lesnicker. I would say interesting. I think that's- Now that's a very Minnesota word that has broad <laughs> definition. So I'm gonna have you dig uh, in. Uh, I'll dig in. I just uh, read a report today that uh, Minnesota is in the top five states for people leaving the states. And so it was interesting to me to see Minnesota is now with California and Illinois in the top five states with the most people leaving their states. And so our border states aren't on that list. So we can't say it's weather because North Dakota certainly doesn't have um, balmy tropical weather either all year. So that's concerning to me. And I think listening to the business community, just tr there, I still run into people that don't know we have sick and safe time changes that happened in the state of Minnesota. And so we have people that are trying to roll their, you know, all these human resource benefits and they have one employee to 50 employees to 200 employees. And so they're, they're feeling tremendously overwhelmed. I've talked to people that are in the garbage business, uh, building construction and they said, I, I gotta have a, hire people to spend thousands of dollars right now to redo handbooks and just implement this, let alone explain it to the employees. And so I think, I think the uh, employers are very concerned of what the implementation, implementation of the paid family leave is gonna be, but it, cause it's already being projected to be millions over budget. And so I think they're nervous of where this is going to put us for growth because without a strong business space in Minnesota, we don't have a strong commercial tax base. And without that, the taxes just only go to us as individuals. And so I think it's an interesting assessment. I believe in Minnesota and you know i think we have to do better and so monitoring all of this is going to be really critical right now but i think we have a we're making the top 
lists for reasons that I don't think we want to be on those lists. I'd like to see us make other lists. So I think we need, we need to do better. And absolutely, the taxes are higher. Uh, to Senator Rarick's point, we know where we fall for commercial tax base and individual taxes, and then we had tax changes for everything from driver's licenses to you know, mandates and delivery fees and Amazon packages. And so there's just a, the, the, the living expenses for people, the reports say they're $13,000 more than they were a year ago for people to buy the household products. So that's hitting people every time and they get paid. They just have less money to work with, to run their life. And so when I'm listening to people that are emailing, calling me, they're, they're concerned, very concerned. So it sounds like you went from the interesting camp to the concern camp by the, by the end of your answer. Yes, 100%, okay. 100%. And, and just as a reminder, we have two Republican legislators on the show. I'll be asking that question when Democrats come on the show too and see if they have similar or interesting answers interesting. as well, yes. <laughs> yes. All right, uh, so uh, within that governor's state of the state address as well, he put out, laid out his priorities, of course, the capital investment bill, mm -hmm. his supplemental budget requests in the areas of emergency services that we talked about in some other places. He also talked about uh, guns. Mm -hmm. And um, I know a big discussion is around straw purchases. Now, traditionally, there hasn't been a lot of legislation passed around gun, uh, gun legislation in general, but it seems to be gathering bipartisan support around looking at straw purchases, which is defined as somebody buying a gun for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And we all, of course, know of the tragedy down in the Twin Cities of some police officers and EMS uh, 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 worker who were tragically killed in a standoff at a home. Um, what is the likelihood and w do you support any changes in our uh, gun legislation, especially the straw purchase uh, effort? Senator Rarick, we're going to start with you. Um, yeah, you know, it's a, the straw purchase piece has been uh, discussed for a few years. Uh, there's, the bills have been out there uh, to move a doing the straw purchase where you're buying a gun for somebody who you know is a prohibited person. Mm -hmm. um, it's a gross misdemeanor right now, and the legislation is out there to make it a felony. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do believe there's a bipartisan support that would uh, get that bill passed. Um, I think it's one of those things uh, we, we've heard from prosecutors uh, who say that it's a gross misdemeanor isn't strong enough where it's worth prosecuting. The courts are so overwhelmed, um, they want to see that penalty move to a felony so that they will indeed prosecute. And I think that's one of the things um, you've heard many Republicans talking about. Let's enforce the laws that are on the books uh, for the criminals. And so if that's something we can do to get one of those laws uh, better enforced, I, I think that's a, a very good discussion and something that could uh, get done. Uh, as far as some of the others, like the safe storage, um, I th there are a lot of people, a lot of law enforcement even, who are just saying that is not, uh, that is not gonna help anything. Um, a lot of people have uh, guns in their homes for personal protection, and if your gun and your ammo have to be locked up in separate places, that no longer affords you that ability to protect yourself, so in your own home. So I think that one, there's some problems uh, with that one. A um, few of the others, I, I don't know if uh, there'll be any movement on them this year, uh, but that straw purchase one, I believe if, if it can uh, be done. Uh, right now, there's some political games being played. It's two Republicans who submitted the bill last year, and now uh, two Democrats have submitted the exact same bill. So to me, I think if we could get the politics out of it, let's kind of figure out a way to give everybody uh, the credit if we're going to get it done instead of trying to turn it into a party fight. Um, I think then something positive could happen. Representative Lesnikar, your uh, position on straw purchases. I, I agree with Senator Eric. I think that the intent of it is to make it clear to the public that this is, you're, there's going to be a penalty if you intentionally purchase a gun for somebody that you know is a felon. And in the case of Burnsville, there was a documented record of why the person could not have their Second Amendment rights restored. So after, after serving their time, they denied it. And so it was known. And maybe this would have made an, an impact or not, we'll never know. But I think there's a bigger issue here, and that is, you know, we are seeing laws, uh, bills being introduced one after another of just really minimizing criminal behavior. And so I think that's 
you know, when we're calling people that have been, had involvement with criminal justice instead of calling it criminal behavior, that's a problem to me. We're, April's been de determined a proclamation month for second chances. And I've had so many people emailing me say, there is no second chance for a victim. There is no second chance. And so what are we doing for women who have repetitive domestic violence situations? What are we doing for people that have rap sheets that are a mile long? What are we doing to protect law-abiding citizens? And people are frustrated to see bills introduced that just reduce all minimum sentence for anybody that has a firearm, that is in a firearm situation that uh, is doing illegal behavior, to have no minimum sentencing. And they're really wondering, why are we protecting the criminals so much? And I think that's a very valid question. All right. So one of the other uh, bigger topics that are coming up uh, this legislative session, and started last legislative session as well, is sports betting. And so uh, introduced uh, many years, gained some traction in the legislature, bipartisan last year. It's a big topic again this year. I know there's undercurrents of other issues below it, but what is the likelihood of sports betting um, getting past this legislative session? Representative Lesnikar, we'll start with you. I would say, I don't know, I, I, I haven't heard it at, at my committees yet, but I'd say it has a, probably more than a 50-50 chance that it could get heard. And I will be open to listening to that. I, I know that the other states do it. I'm, I'm well aware, I've been listening to conversations already that people can do sports betting on the internet and a variety of other ways right now. And so we're gonna be listening as legislators uh, to see what the pathway for Minnesota is. What are you gonna to need to hear to decide, to, to help you make your decision at this point? I think just the same things that go on with all types of, of you know, gambling and that type of thing, looking at it, the whole big picture of how we're going to protect kids, what we're doing, you know, what the system's going to be for the taxes, how it's going to flow into the state, what that's gonna look like, and what the implications are to, uh, the horse racing and all those other elements that go on that uh, making sure I have an understanding of what it exactly is. So I'm gonna be listening to that and I think we'll probably hear some you know, conversations on the House floor. Senator Rarick, uh, have you taken a position on this yet and uh, what, what do you think about this issue? Um, it'll, I'm generally in favor. It's going to depend on exactly what the proposal is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think one of the concerns around it, anytime you're expanding gambling, um, one, are you making it too easy for folks to get into trouble and gamble everything away? Uh, but two, what are the impacts going to be on the other already established uh, gambling uh, that's out there? And for me, one of the biggest concerns I have is um, what will be the impact on our local charitable gaming folks, the, the, the ones who do the pull tabs in our local bars? that money is going directly back into our communities to support uh, local functions. Mm -hmm. So I wanna make sure that those groups are not negatively impacted by anything new that we're doing because the new money is going, gonna be going out, well the state will get its share and, and probably these, these online apps will get their share. Um, I wanna make sure that our locals are not being left out of the equation. So it's sounding like that has been uh, listened to and there is going to be some pieces that uh, really help the local uh, charitable gambling folks with their taxes. Um, and then, but the other thing, I guess, again, I'm worried about uh, the proposals are out there, you know, for the apps on your phones. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna see some protections around there so that, right, the person can't be sitting in their basement and, and gamble away everything they have and, and nobody else has any clue. It'd be nice that there's at least some way uh, for family members to, to see a pattern and to maybe be able to intervene to know um, if it's, if you can just do it anywhere on an app, um, people can get in a lot of trouble without anyone else knowing. Another big topic uh, continually, and talked about this legislative session, and Representative Lesnikar, you brought it up earlier, is childcare. Uh, cost of childcare for families, uh, the, the challenge that providers have in, in making money uh, and being profitable, workforce issues, it runs the gamut. Um, there have been some proposals this year uh, that were, have been introduced to really put a limit on how much families uh, would need to pay to afford childcare. Uh, they've been heard in committee. Generally, what I've been hearing is that uh, folks are saying it's too expensive for the situation we're in today in this non-budget year. But Representative Lesnar, can you talk a bit about anything that you see potentially being passed this year dealing with childcare? 
That's a good question. I mean, we're in a situation where the proposals that have come, the proposal of 7% of income to be a max for families to use is just, it's a great, sounds great, and everybody would love it. I've paid for childcare too, and I understand the ask, but the reality is, is that the state doesn't have the money for that. And so I've been looking at opportunities to decrease that burden for families through uh, tax deductions, for middle income people too, because one of the things I hear from people is we just aren't getting any help. Uh, the middle income, the tax, child ta tax credit basically help people if you make $19 an hour or less, you know, 14 to $19 an hour, and for to get the 1750. So that's a very low amount of income. For, and most families need to make more than that uh, to, to be able to pay for childcare and to, to, to live. So I've been looking at child tax credits and also signed on, authored a bill for businesses to expand child care at their business site and at their property or in t or purchase a building and so looking at initiatives like that and then the mandates i've spent a tremendous amount of time touring the entire state in my district and outside to see family child care and center-based child care and the mandates stack up costs and so the mandates look at what we require for education who can be a teacher who can you know uh, what the ratios are all of those things, square footage, I wrote some uh, bills to try to help the freestanding centers so that they can have uh, fair and reasonable staffing ratios so that they can have success. Yeah, you know, uh, this is a big one and I, the, it's the mandate piece and some of the requirements that we've put on these. I, you look back uh, not that many years ago, you know, we had so many more uh, families that would, uh, one person in a community might say, you know, I'm one of the, parents is going to stay home uh, to watch their kids mm -hmm. and then they would have other families um, come in and they would watch their kids as well the you know in-home daycares and and they weren't meant to be a permanent business they were going to do it for a limited amount of time and we just don't see that anymore because of the fact of all these requirements that got put on them that they would have to meet it was never meant to be a like I said a career or a, a to do this permanently, um, they were just trying to meet a need and especially for our small rural communities, that is going to be critical that we can get that back um, to allow for that to happen without the state just, they're watching and everything they're doing and putting requirements on upgrades they have to do to their house. Um, if families could have an option, I think a lot of families in rural Minnesota would pick that and then we would open up more spaces and then, then the competition would help drive the prices down. Um, we have about uh, a little less than 10 minutes left. We've got some other, we've got some questions to get to. Uh, it would be remiss though, Senator Rarick, if I want to talk about a bill you introduced this year that ruffled some feathers up on the Iron Range. <laughs> and since we're a show for Northern Minnesota and I happen to be an Iron Ranger, I feel compelled to ask the question. And so uh, mining, prop, mining production taxes that are collected on mining companies are, are collected in lieu of or instead of property taxes. And there's a funding formula that the state sets and there's a defined area where those taxes are both collected and then distributed and it's based on school districts and so it's roughly the Arrowhead region in northeastern Minnesota. You proposed legislation to and it's based on school districts actually the boundaries of school districts. You proposed expanding uh, that service area to four school districts in and around uh, where you you represent. Can you talk about why you introduced that legislation and uh, what's going on with it today? Yeah, so um, the Talon Mine is going to you know hopefully be opening uh, in the very near future and this operates outside of the normal, what we consider the taconite uh, mining area. And so um, last legislative session, the McGregor School District was added in and the language was written as such that when the mining actually starts within their school district, they would be incorporated in and be able to start receiving those same um, taxes within their school district. Um, I have school districts in my area that also have, um, Talon Mine has lease rights in their school districts and they came to me and asked, well, why aren't we included in that? So I went to our revisers and I had the exact same language drafted that um, if and when and only when mining actually starts happening within their school districts, uh, then they would be incorporated into the Taconite Assistance Area to receive those uh, revenues just like the other schools that have mining in their school districts receive. 
couple more questions here. Um, the issue of property taxes has come up and now is the time of the year where folks are getting their statements from the county. And just as a reminder, property taxes are collected uh, for county, city, and school district serv services. But the state does play a role from time to time in property taxes, not a primary role as well. But the question uh, from Duluth is, uh, why don't you give landlords a reduction on their property taxes so they don't need to pass it on to their tenants as an increase in their rent? So if you could address that specific issue and then more broadly, what is the role of state legislators and state government on local property taxes? Um, so uh, it's one of those weird roles, right? The state um, sets the parameters for the categories. And this is one, uh, I only served two years on the property tax committee but it was one I learned that's so, uh, for Minnesota, something we need to address. But uh, we have, the last I heard, 57 categories uh, for property taxes. The state with the next most has 15, which makes our property tax system very confusing. Um, but so we determine the rate, basically, at which every property is going to be taxed at. And so then, just as you said, it's the counties, the cities, the townships, the school districts, that when they set their levies and determine how much they need, those formulas are used to determine how much each property contributes to that. Now, we can, at the state level, we've done things for uh, veterans, where we say, um, we're going to eliminate a portion of their property tax. And in those cases, the state then puts money forward that goes out to the, the counties, the cities, the school districts to cover that. Um, so if we were going to, what the caller uh, asked for, um, if we were to do that, it would require the state to kick that money in um, to make that happen. But I think that's typically, um, that's not something that the state would typically do. That would be something you would look either for the state to reduce what the, they would owe uh, on the formula or uh, something done at the county level uh, to make what he's asking for happen. But uh, I think those, those questions come up all the time from everyone. Why is my property taxed at this? And we could make uh, things more affordable um, if we didn't. Um, I agree, those are all discussions that uh, we have all the time at the Capitol. So <laughs> um, unfortunately, I, I can't get deeper into uh, that particular, um, having not served on a tax committee for a long time. But I, I know those exact discussions happen in tax committee all the time. Okay. Anything to add, Representative Lesnar? That's a com conversation that I've had with many constituents is property taxes. So it's a great question from this landlord. I'm willing to look at every and all thing on property taxes because I think the valuations affecting businesses, the valuation for personal property and business property is affecting obviously the tax base. So I've been looking at bills that are looking at that for property taxes for individuals of how they're assessing that value and how, what the look back period is because we've seen real estate go up and down and many of the people are like, well, when the real estate market goes down, are my property taxes going to go down? Generally speaking, we don't see that happen in the same capacity. So I've also looked at, I've signed on to bills that would uh, change the property tax formula for some senior citizens. And so many of them, you know, they're, they're on a very fixed income. And so the property tax swing, when it goes up 20% and you're, you're getting 3% or less in your income base, that's a big deal. And so I'm concerned that we're going to force seniors right out of their home. And the, the initiative in One Minnesota is to keep seniors at home. So that's not going to happen if they get forced out with property taxes. So I've signed on to bills that we're, are going to help that. And directly to this viewer, just uh, to, to close the loop, do we see anything potentially happening this session on this? Because it sounds like issues you're talking about would impact the state budget. And, Correct. And so Correct. Li I would likelihood say of something happening this year? Probably not, but okay. it's definitely we need to be looking at property taxes for landlords and for businesses and for individuals. Okay. I think we have time for at least one more question here. Another viewer writes in and says, what are the chances to change the annexation law to ensure that cities annexing a township must have consensus from both the township and the city. Do either of you have any knowledge in this? There are a bunch of committees, and so not every legislator serves on every committee. So anybody have any knowledge on this? Uh, Senator Rarick, you're nodding your head yes. Yeah, yeah um, this is one I've been, uh, my whole time in the legislature, this has been around for a long, long time. Um, you know, when you look at the metro area, 
Um, you see, you can see this has been happening a long time. You know, I think of places like uh, Corcoran or you know things like where a township incorporates to become a city to stop that very thing from happening. Um, I know up around this area. Uh, that uh, Midway Township and some of the others around uh, Duluth and Proctor and Hermantown are, are going through some of these very same discussions. Uh, it happens uh, every year. Um, local government uh, committee talks about this all the time. Um, and boy, it's, it's such a tough one because the, the townships come in and they see things one way, the cities come in, they see things a different way. And it all, it never seems like one side ever has enough folks on the committees to get their way through. and. Uh, boy, coming up with a changing that system, I you know it's been a long time, and I don't uh, see anything has really happened. Uh, so it's that the biggest remedy for a township that's struggling with that, unfortunately, is incorporating and becoming a city. Okay, we just have a few seconds left. Uh, <laughs> Tomorrow's Township Day, so I will be hearing this, I'm sure. So it's Township Day at the Capitol, so yeah. we will be talking about this. But to Senator Rarick's point, I think it's it's something that has been talked about for a long time, and the conversations are going to continue. And uh, I don't have the answers right now, and I don't think we're going to be hearing this uh, in this year. It's We have a month left, basically, of session, and we have some big issues to get through that we've talked about already today. So I think it's going to continue uh, for biennium's to come on this issue of annexation. All right, and just in 10 seconds apiece, was there one issue, just to kind of whet the appetite of the viewers, one issue we didn't discuss today, just topic-wise, that you see uh, having an impact here at the end of the session? Real quickly, Representative Lesnikar. Uber, Lyft. Uber and Lyft. Yes. Um, you know, all, everything that happened to schools last year, uh, they're looking for some relief, and I have a bill that would extend uh, this out three years. I think that's something we uh, need to be talking about as well. All right. Well, keep us on the edge of our seat, and maybe you'll come back and talk about it before the end of the session. Thank you yes. both very much. And we are out of time. I'd like to thank Senator Rarick and Representative Zlesnikar for joining us here this evening, answering questions and sharing their thoughts. We will be back again next Sunday at 5 to speak with more members of the Minnesota State Legislature and answer more of your questions. And thank you to the viewers at home for calling and writing in with your questions. You're playing a vital part in our representative government system. For the team here at PBS North, I'm Tony Sertich. Have a great evening.